Welcome everyone for joining us today for the Women in OR and Analytics Network event uh, from the UK OR Society. Um, I am Anuncia Resposito Mideo or Nuncia from uh, University College Dublin and I'm one of the organizers. And I'm Nandia Papa Michael from the University of Manchester. Um, you may recall that our event was scheduled for the 16th of March 2020. It was cancelled. That day, the health secretary made an announcement about the possible lockdown. And um, we officially went into a national UK lockdown a week later. Um, and, and then, you know, we decided to schedule our event for today. Guess what? As we all know, England is going to a lockdown in a few hours' time. Uh, so to those who are developers out there who are building sophisticated forecasting and simulation models, and they want to estimate or other guess when the government is going to introduce an intervention, just have a look at the scheduling of our events at our website. Um, uh, but, uh, you, you know, just for all those of you who had to cancel any last minute shopping trips, we promise you, you are in for a treat. Now, at this stage, if that was a face-to-face -face, uh, event, I was going to give you information about health and safety and what to do in an emergency. Instead, I'm going to hand over to Nasia, who is going to tell you more about housekeeping and etiquette. Yes, yeah, so just a bit of housekeeping before we start the event. Uh, as you know, we are on Zoom. Uh, so uh, please uh, try to keep your mic on mute and uh, switch your camera off, especially at the time of the plenary speakers, so that the focus would be on them. Uh, just as a recommendation, um, we advise you to position the speaker uh, window in the top right corner, so you can see all the slides that will be displayed at the same time. Uh, if you want to ask any question, please use the chat function and um, we will review the questions. Uh, at the same time, some polls will be displayed. So if you're joining us via browser, this won't be possible to you. But if you're using the app for sure, you'll be able to see them. And uh, finally, this meeting is recorded. So uh, at the end, it will be made available to you. Uh, now uh, we're going to have a poll. And I have to say, when I am a participant, I always look forward to these interactive sessions. We would like to know a bit more about you. Um, as an organizer, I'm really glad that Amy Hughes from the R Society is uh, dealing with all the technical issues. Uh, so Amy, can we have the first question, please? And the first question is, are you an academic? Or and you could be a PhD student, a postdoc, or, or a lecturer, a senior lecturer, a professor, or are you a practitioner, both retired, or none of the above? I'm going to choose now. Uh, the second question is, are you based in the UK or outside the UK? And the third question is, are you a member of Warren? Yes or no? So we're going to give a few more seconds to people uh, to fill out and complete the questionnaire. So Amy, when you get the chance, could you please show us the results? Yes, just gonna let everyone finish and then um, I'll end that and we can share the results. Oh, wow, yeah. so uh, we can see that 50% uh, of us, uh, we are academics, but I'm really pleased to see so many practitioners uh, out there. We have some uh, very valued members of our community who are uh, retired and um, a few undergraduates and non OR people. Uh, now, most of us, we are based in the UK. Um, and finally, uh, half of us are members of Warren, but roughly, you know, 45% we are not members of Warren. And I would like really to see who you are, those of you who are not really members of Warren, because I really hope that by the end of the session, you're going to join us. So many thanks for participating. Uh, and now I'm trying to move on to my next slide. Yes. Uh, and this is a program for today. And I said before, we are in for a treat. After my introduction, Professor Julia Buckingham is going to give us a speech. And I have to say, Julia is uh, someone I call 
a visible academic. Uh, I've seen her many times on TV before, uh, and it was only this week that uh, I listened to her on BBC Sounds. Uh, we're going to have a break. Uh, we're going to enjoy a nice cup of coffee or tea and even better biscuits. And after that, uh, I'm really pleased that Laura Reed is going to join us. And uh, Laura, she's a practitioner. She's the CEO of Simulate. And she's someone that uh, we wanted to, in to involve in our events for a while. And I'm really pleased that Laura has accepted our invitation and she's going to coordinate the second half of this uh, uh, session. Uh, we're going to have a bit of networking as well, so more to follow. Uh, finally, Nancy is going to give you some more details about Warren. And the plan is that we are going to finish at 6.30. Uh, you might uh, be wondering, especially uh, those of you uh, uh, who said that you're not really members of Warren, but I suppose and I assume that you're interested in Warren and this is one of the reasons why you're attending the event today. Just a few more details who we are. And we are a network of women in R and analytics. And our objectives are very much in line with uh, the priorities and strategic priorities of the OR society. It's all about advancing knowledge, interest, and education in OR. And uh, uh, our main objective is not only to support, but also to empower women of all ages, because we want women to consider a career in OR, to work in OR, to study in OR, and try to turn any barriers into enablers. Uh, and over here you can see the logo uh, uh, and uh, some people behind the scenes have been very busy coming up with a new logo for Warren. And I would like to thank all our sponsors that you can see over here. We have a range of academic institutions and companies. So we are very grateful to them. Um, now uh, a few more details about Warren. Uh, our chair is uh, Francis O'Brien. Uh, and, uh, um, and also over here, you can see uh, we have three pillars, three main projects under the umbrella of Warren. Um, uh, we have Ruth Kaufman, who is responsible for events. So if you have any ideas about new events, maybe you want to organize a session, maybe you have been inspired after the event today and you want to do something, please get in, in touch with Ruth. And, and I have to say with every kind of event and with every kind of initiative or network, uh, you always need an army of people behind you. And uh, at this point, I would like to say that this particular event would not have been possible without all the help, help and support we have received from Francis and Ruth and of course, Amy. Um, uh, we have another initiative uh, uh, that uh, we are coordinating uh, under uh, um, Warren, and it is the mentoring scheme, and it is our ambition to set up uh, a mentoring uh, scheme for Warren and perhaps for the OR society in the long term. So if you are interested, please uh, get in touch with me. Uh, and I have to say two um, inspirational women that have already joined me in this effort, but I would like to hear from more of you. And finally, uh, you know, we have another initiative, it is PR in media, uh, and we would like uh, uh, the, the network to be more visible on a range of social media platforms. And it always amazes me how many people out there rely on uh, TikTok for politics, you know, to find out about politics, about current affairs. So this really makes me think how important it is to be present as a network and as a society on a, a wide range of platforms. And if you want really to do something about media and PR, please get in touch with Nasia. And now I'm going to hand over to Nasia, who's going to give us an introduction to Julia's presentation. Okay, so let me thank again, uh, Professor Julia Buckingham to joining us today. So I'm just gonna give a short uh, summary about her and then I'm gonna leave, leave her the floor for her talk. So Julia Buckingham is uh, currently treasurer and a trustee of Universities UK, a director of Imperial College Health Partners and of the National Center for Universities and Business a member of the All Party Parliamentary University Group Council, a member of the Heathrow Skills Task Force, chair of the Concorda Strategy Group, supporting the career development of researchers and chair of the Athena's One Review Steering Group. 
In 2012, she was appointed Vice Chancellor and President of Brunel University London. Throughout her career, Julia has combined research and education with supporting the broader aspects of academic life through work with the research councils, medical charities, and learned societies. She has published widely in her field, served on numerous national and international review panels, and received a number of prestigious awards and honors for her work. She was awarded a CBE in 2018 for services to biology and education. So thank you so much, Julia, for being here today. And the talk she's going to offer us today, it's titled Never a Dull Moment, My Life in Academia. We look forward to it. Well, thank you very much indeed. And I'm going to try now and share my screen. So let's hope the tech works. Um, so shout now if it doesn't. Hang on a second. Now that should, can people see that? Yes. Good. Now let me see if I can just get it up into full screen. Um, does that still work? Yes, you're sharing it is in a preview mode, so not entirely full screen, but it should be full. No, well, okay, you, but you can see you can see the slide. Yes, we can. Yes. yes. Okay. Well, that's great. Now, well, well, firstly, thank you very much indeed for inviting me along to this meeting. And it seems a long time since March, um, but you know, here we are again, just at the start of another lockdown and just at the start of a, another load of challenges for all of us in academia and indeed every, everywhere else. And when I was asked to give this talk, I, I was asked to talk really about what it's been like for me um, as a woman having a career in academia. And in a nutshell, I can say, um, I've had a fantastic time. I don't think I would ever regret it. I've had a really wonderful time, but it hasn't always been a smooth path any more than a career in any other profession has been a smooth path. But above all, I've, I've had a lot of fun and I think it's important that we all have fun in our lives, um, even if there are some downsides as well. So I'm gonna go back to the very beginning and what made me become an academic. And I, I'd love to be able to tell you that I woke up in my pram one morning and thought I wanted to be a scientist, um, but nothing could be further from the truth. Um, I think I had a, a very, I had a lovely childhood. I was lucky in that I lived in the country. Um, looking back on it, I think it's interesting that I went to an all girls school. And I think in my age group of people, I think people who went to, girls who went to all girls schools probably became more academic and were more likely to go to university. But I think I was a very normal child. Um, I liked um, my, my real passion in life was music and music is still my number one passion in life. Um, and when I was in my teens, I, I really wanted to be a professional musician. That was absolutely my, my greatest joy. But I was also keen on, on literature, drama, um, I liked sailing, I liked horses, I was quite sporty, but I always had a sneaking interest in medicine as well. There was something about medicine and caring that appealed to me as well. But as I said, music was my, my first thing. And it was when I was about 16, I realized that I wasn't gonna crack it in music. I wasn't gonna be good enough to be a performer, which is what I really wanted to do. I didn't want to be a teacher. So I started to focus on science and I, I, I loved science, but it was a second choice for me. It certainly wasn't the first thing I, I wanted to do. But I did science A-levels and I thought when I first started those science A-levels that I wanted to be a doctor. Um, but we had the most amazing biology teacher. She was absolutely stunning. And she just finished her PhD. And this was her first teaching job. And she was so enthusiastic about her research. And I can, I can still remember her classes to this day. And that's what changed me. And I turned down my place to do medicine and I decided to go off to the University of Sheffield and do a degree in zoology so that I could really focus on, on the research aspects of biology because that's where I thought my, my interest lay. So off I went to Sheffield, which I really enjoyed. Um, I come from the south of England. I hadn't really spent very much time in the more northerly parts of England. So it was, it was great from that perspective, wonderful countryside around Sheffield and a lovely city. And one of the things I remember about Sheffield that's really stuck in my mind, and I think it's stuck with me as I've gone through my career, 
um, was how much Sheffield loved the university. And we really were an integral part of the city. And I think as a student, I felt the whole city really valued the university. And of course, now it's got a second university. But while I was at university, of course, I had wonderful friends and I had a lot of fun. And many of those friends are still my friends today. They're still my closest friends. But I also loved the course. And what really inspired me, firstly, was I became interested in endocrinology. And for those of you who don't know what endocrinology is, it's the study of hormones. Um, and the department that I was in, um, that was their field of expertise. So I suppose it was only natural that that's really what inspired me because of, again, it's another example of how it was the people who taught me who really, really stimulated my interest. And two people stand out in my mind. The first was my tutor, who was a chap called Ian Chester Jones. And he was interested in a very small gland that produces hormones that sits just on top of our kidneys called the adrenal gland. And the adrenal gland is concerned with stress and it produces um, adrenaline. And I'm sure you've all heard of adrenaline, but it also produces another hormone concerned with stress um, in its outer zone, the cortex. And that's a hormone called cortisol. And you may well have heard of cortisol and if you haven't heard of cortisol, you may have heard of dexamethasone because dexamethasone looks like cortisol. It's chemically very similar and it acts like cortisol. And it's now being used clinically to help people who've got COVID. And it's the, I think it was the first drug that was shown to reduce the severity of the disease and increase the likelihood of recovery. So right back in, in the 90, late 1960s, early 1970s, this guy, Ian Chester Jones, was working on that hormone cortisol, and he was an inspirational lecturer. lecturer. The other person was a chap called Geoffrey Harris, who actually was working at Oxford, but he was a very close friend of Sheffield, and he used to come very frequently. And he was interested in a, a tiny little gland that produces hormones right at the base of our brain called the pituitary gland. And this gland produces a lot of hormones. It's sometimes called the master gland. And those hormones control our adrenal gland, our ovaries if we're female, our testes if we're male, um, our thyroid glands, it controls our growth and many other things as well. So it really is a master gland. And what Jeffrey Harris was interested in was, was how the brain influenced that little gland. Why did it sit directly under the brain? And it was a really good question because there aren't any obvious nervous links between the brain and this little pituitary gland. So, so when you clench your fish, for example, what's happening is the brain is sending a message down the nerves in your arm to tell you to clench your fist. But when you release hormones from the pituitary gland, there isn't a nerve that goes from the bit of the brain above the pituitary down into the pituitary gland, but there is a very special blood vessel and what this guy showed, and this was the first time ever, and this excited me, it might sound a bit mad to you, but it excited me that the brain produces chemicals and those chemicals control that little gland. And I was absolutely fascinated by that and I'm fascinated by the experiments that Jeffrey Harris did. And they were very primitive when you think of the clever things that people do these days. But that sort of stuck with me. But you know, time went on and um, I graduated and, I didn't have a career plan. I've never had a career plan. Um, but I did know that I wanted to do research. Um, you might smile at this one. I'd had enough of universities. I was never going to enter a university again. I was going off into the private sector to do research. And I went off to what was then Glaxo Laboratories, which is now GSK. I was very keen to go to London. And this place is not very far from London. Um, but what attracted me to Glaxo was they were working on analogues of this hormone cortisol. And I was lucky enough to get a graduate um, level entry job. So off I went. And Glaxo was my introduction to drug discovery. And I am now or was a pharmacologist. And I've worked in pharmacology for much of my career. And I've been really interested in trying to understand um, how drugs work on the body and how we can use drugs to understand 
how the body works. So Glaxo was a great introduction to that, but it was also a great disappointment to me. Um, and I think it was a disappointment because I realized I, I didn't really have the profit motive. Um, I was really interested in the science and I wanted to drive the science forward. And I found it very frustrating when if things didn't look as though they were going to go towards a product, then the project stopped. And one day, we used to have quite a lot of outside speakers. One day we had a speaker who came along and you'll recognize these two pictures that I just showed you. He talked about that little pituitary gland and the hypothalamus on top of it and how that related to that hormone cortisol being produced by the adrenal cortex. And what he was interested in was how that all worked and how the levels of cortisol in our circulation were kept in, in control. And uh, Julia, uh, I'm very sorry, can I interrupt you just for a minute? Yes. Because some people, like, you know, just have complaints that they cannot read your slides. So can we try really to adjust the settings? Uh, all maybe right. we're well, going to be like something to, lucky. What uh, would you Amy, like me to do? Uh, Amy, could you please uh, tell us what Julia? Yeah. If you just go to display mm -hmm. settings at the top of that, uh, the screen that you're currently on with that has the notes slide. Yeah. Yeah, and then just swap the first one, swap the slideshow, that one there. Does that work? Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Right. Okay. Well, thank you for telling me because I can yes. see that because I can see it as it is now. It doesn't make any difference to me. Right. Okay. So he came along and he talked about the relationship between the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the adrenal gland, this hormone cortisol that I was really interested in, I still am interested in, and how there was a sort of feedback loop that regulated the secretion of cortisol. And we know now that keeping cortisol concentrations in our blood at the right level is critically important for our health. So understanding that feedback loop is absolutely critical. So I was riveted by this lecture and off he went. And I was chatting to some colleagues afterwards and they said to me, you know, you're in the wrong job. Um, you really ought to go and do a PhD and do research um, in an academic environment. So I wrote to this chap and said, I'd like to come and work with you. And he wrote back, because it wasn't email in those days, of course, he wrote back and said, well, I've got a post coming up. Why don't you apply for it? And that's exactly what I did. And I was very lucky in that I got the job. The other thing I was very lucky about was that um, a, a, a chap that I was beginning to know quite well said to me if I got the job he'd take me out to dinner and he did and I'm still married to him so there you go so anyway off I went to the Royal Free Hospital School of Medicine which is now part of UCL to start pharmacology proper to start my PhD in those days you couldn't what we call discipline hop. It was a bit disapproved of when I did my PhD. It was, you know, disciplines were very narrow things. So I actually had to do some exams in pharmacology in order to be able to register for my PhD. Um, but that was fine. And I also had an introduction to teaching and it was thought important back then, as I still believe it is today, that PhD students get engaged with teaching, um, not just because it's good for the students, um, but because it's good for them and they learn, there's nothing like having to teach something to find out what you don't know. Um, and it's a great skill to develop for all sorts of reasons. So I had, I had a really great time doing my PhD and I had lots of advice, um, some of which was interesting and, and quite amusing. Um, my supervisor was, was very keen that I got engaged in the broader science community. And I was quite a shrinking varlet when I was 21 and started my PhD. And he really encouraged me to join the learned societies and get involved in their work and to get up and give talks. And he used to say, you have to get your face in front of the buggers if they're going to remember you and network, network, network. And actually that was incredibly valuable advice. And I would say that to any young person now, um, it's no use being passive. If you're ambitious and you want a career, you've got to get out there and, and talk to people. Um, we used to have quite a spirited relationship um, in that we argued a lot about political things. And when he got fed up with me, he used to tell me to go home and do the bloody ironing. 
um, and we used to joke about it. We, we were still joking about it when he died about 10 years ago. Um, but there were also some more constructive bits of advice. And we had a, a lady head of department. She was a very interesting, a very distinguished lady. And when I finished my PhD, I was offered a, a lectureship in a clinical department. I was in a non-clinical department. And she was very concerned that as a, a, a non-medic, if I went into a clinical department, I would be seen as a pair of hands, not as an equal party. Now, today I would say that's fundamentally wrong. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I think that ethos very much um, happened still. And she found a way for funding to keep me in the department while we got some grant money. Um, but other things happened as well. Um, as I, I got married almost as soon as I finished my PhD. And she said to me, I can still remember her saying the day before I went off before my wedding, her saying to me that marriage is the most important step you'll ever take. And I thought, well, that's rich coming from you because I think you're on husband number four. Um, but actually it was a, a very, very good piece of advice. And my boss's wife said to me, um, never learn to start the lawnmower. And I've never learned to start the lawnmower, but I think what she was really saying was, if you're going to have a career and your husband's having a career and you're going to do all the other things, don't think you can do everything. Make sure that you have some division of labor in the household. And I wouldn't want to turn into um, Theresa May and her husband and having girls and boys jobs, um, but it's certainly a good idea to make sure that you have a division of labor. And the other bit of advice came from my mother-in-law. Um, who was a businesswoman. And I think she understood that both my husband and I were pretty ambitious and she was concerned uh, that we would burn ourselves out because we were working very long hours. And her advice was get a good woman. And what she meant by that is if you're going to be in the lab at the crack of dawn and you're still going to be there late at night, you cannot do everything, make sure you get proper support in the house. And that actually was also really, really good advice. Just make sure you get the balance of things in your life good. So after that, um, I went on to do a postdoc and I was lucky in that I could stay where I was so I didn't have to go through all those traumas. That was important because I just got married and my husband and I had made an agreement that we were going to be based in London. He had left his job in the city and started up his own business. Um, and that was going to be in London, that was the best place for him. And there were a lot of, and there still are of course, a lot of universities in London, so plenty of job opportunities for me. So we made a really clear strategic decision that we were gonna base ourselves in London. But being a postdoc was, was different. Um, I had more independence, but of course with more independence came more responsibility and more accountability. And I became more conscious of the pressures that we all feel when we're working in research to publish. Um, as I said before, to get out and talk about your research, to learn to start writing grants, to understand that you're responsible for raising your own grant money, no one does it for you. And if you don't write those grants, you don't get them. And of course, building your teaching portfolio. But those were a great six years. Um, it was great fantastic group of people I was working with. It was a very social department. We had a lot of fun. And I think, I think the work-life balance then was, was actually good. And then I got my first academic job. And at that point, the Royal Free, which had been in, in a really lovely part of London, moved up to an even nicer part of London, to Hampstead. But unfortunately, as you can see from the picture, um, the building was nothing like as glamorous as the one down in um, Bloomsbury. But becoming an academic, there were all the joys and all the challenges of, of being an academic. Um, you know, really having my own research grant for the first time and, and all the things that go with being an academic, beginning to go around the world to speak at meetings. Um, but also increasingly recognizing that if I wanted to progress my career, um, I had to think hard about taking on leadership roles. It wasn't simply about doing the research and the teaching, which is in itself a lot to do, but really thinking about how to get more involved in, in leadership in little ways to start with, but ultimately in that role, becoming acting head of department for a couple of years. It was also a difficult time for me family-wise. 
um, my sister, who I'm very close to, um, had gone through a very difficult time. She just had her second child and married for the second time. And um, it was a difficult marriage. And I had to spend a lot of time helping and supporting her and looking after both of her children. And also my father became desperately ill um, and lived in the West Country in Cornwall with my mother. And we had to spend, and I don't regret any of it, it was a privilege to do it, um, a lot of time helping and supporting them, actually over about 10 years when he was desperately ill with cancer. And of course, treatments were less good than that they are now. So it was a challenging time. Um, but one day the phone rang um, and there's an important message to all of you here, um, because I think when I look back on my career, every time I've, I've moved, it's been because someone's given me a push. And my advice to you would be to be a bit more perhaps proactive than I was in my early career. But the phone rang and um, this person on the end of the phone was the Professor of Pharmacology in Cambridge. And he said to me, um, there's a job going at Charing Cross, professorship, head of department. I think you ought to go for it. Um, and I thought about it and I was sort of thought, well, why me? I'm not good enough to do that. You know, all, all the sort of insecurities that I think women very often have. Um, but I did go for it. And I knew I needed to leave the Royal Free. I'd been there for too long, so it was definitely time to move. And fortunately, I did get the job. And off I went to Charing Cross and Westminster Medical School in West London, which looks remarkably like the Royal Free, another concrete jungle full of asbestos and other difficult things. And that was my first real experience of running a department and everything that goes with that. Obviously, broader responsibilities in the medical school, which was a freestanding college of the University of London then, and far more external activities. But core to my activities then really were my, was my research. And I had the most wonderful research group then, fantastic people. And you can see on the bottom right hand side, um, this is the wedding of one of my postdocs. And we were a really, really close knit team. And I think those were some of the most fun times I've ever had in that group actually. It was a real, real team effort. We were very, very close together, very well knitted. Um, and I think that was one of the times when I, I really came to understand the importance of working as a team and how when teams operate well and when they don't operate well. And it was a very, very exciting time. Um, but that, it wasn't all smooth going, nothing is smooth going. There were, were threats and, and there were opportunities. And I was teaching medical students, I was um, doing re medical research and there was going to be a big change in the way in which medicine was taught to students. And it eliminated quite a lot of the science and it eliminated pharmacology, in other words, drugs, which of course are, are one of the big tools of um, a doctor when, when they're working. And I became very exercised about that. And I think that was the first time I'd ever become interested in a sort of political aspect of academia. And I got very engaged in that debate and I fought tooth and nail to keep pharmacology on the curriculum. Um, so that was an interesting time. The, the second thing which came along was Imperial College. And um, there'd been a report out in the early 1990s that said there were too many medical schools in London and they needed to merge and they needed to be part of multi-faculty institutions. And Imperial College, which is in West London, of course, um, was going to merge, take over whatever language you like, um, the four medical schools in West London. And I saw that as a fantastic opportunity. Um, the thought of being part of a multi-faculty organization um, to have scientists, engineers around me as being very, very exciting. And it was. Um, the merger took place in 1997. Um, I moved to the, the Hammersmith next door to Wormwood Scrubs, so not overly salubrious in environment, but a fantastic research environment. And it was a complete sort of, it was a real step up in atmosphere, in excitement. And some people thrived and some people hated it. Um, some people found it very, very challenging. And it was quite a, an interesting task um, to try and help those people get on board with this change and not sort of shrink away from it, but to try and embrace it 
and find ways in which they could make it work for them. Um, and I really, I really loved it. Um, it enabled me to build my research, um, to interact with people from many different disciplines, and actually to get still more involved in, in the running of the organization and the running, of course, of a much, much bigger organization than a small medical school. And one of the best jobs I had was a job called college dean. And Imperial had three college deans who reported to the rector or vice chancellor as they would be called now. And their job was to be the eyes and ears of the university and make sure that things were done properly. Um, things like appointments and promotions and things like that. And it was a real insight to how the, the university worked. Um, and I suppose it was one of the things which was, it was transformative for me um, because it just opened my eyes to the sort of broader opportunities outside being an academic um, that there were for people within the university. And being in Imperial too, it opened many doors to get involved in, in more outside activities. And, and I've always been interested in doing things in, in, the, in the broader environment that supports academia and research, as well as internally. So these were a good 10 years for me. I, I had a lot of fun. Um, I think it was a sort of peaceful side on the domestic side. Um, and it was just a, a good few years. And then the phone rang again. Um, in 2007, and it was the then deputy rector who rang me up to ask me if I would be interested in becoming a pro-rector or a pro-vice chancellor. And I put in an application for the job to become um, pro-rector for education, which enabled me to have the role of looking after Imperial's education portfolio and all the support services that um, came into that. And it was a very, very wide brief. And although Imperial's a science organization, science and medicine, um, it was very good in having arts activities for the students. And it had a very, very strong music department. And that sort of took me back full circle. Um, there I was um, with line management responsibility for the thing which is still my greatest passion, music. And it took me back to, um, Going back to being a, um, a musician, I started to play the piano again, having stopped many years previously, having lessons, and I kept that up. And it was just, a, it's brought a fantastically different dimension to my life, which um, I hope will remain with me for the rest of my days. But of course, it also um, opened my eyes to running the university. And I think it was only when I was in this job that it really, um, made me think I'd like to be a vice chancellor. And part of that was because I had a really great mentor. And I think mentors are, are very important to all of us, people who are outside of your line management, um, but who you feel you can talk to and who tell you the truth, um, not necessarily what you want to hear, but who tell you the truth. And he, he was absolutely fantastic. But I, I, really, I really enjoyed those five years. I met lots of friends. Uh, but I did keep my research going and I did it through leading a doctoral training centre and I've always found it very difficult to let go of research so even though I was doing less of it I still have that interest I've still got it today um, and I had this this great um, doctoral centre um, and we used to have fantastic events every every year where we brought all the PhD students together um, and got them talking about what they were doing. And actually one of them, I'm pleased to say, who was my postdoc in 1997 is now a professor at Brunel. Um, so that's always nice to see. But then, as I said, I was starting to think about what next after Imperial. And I had decided by then that I'd like to lead an institution. And I was very fortunate in, in 2012 to be appointed to Brunel. And Brunel is very different from Imperial. And what really attracted me to Brunel um, was its fantastic track record in attracting um, students from very underprivileged back backgrounds. It does an amazing job in, in widening participation. But it's, a, it's an also an institution that has a huge sense of, of responsibility 
um, in terms of wanting to produce students who are going to go on and have successful careers, um, a huge in ethos of working with industry and on doing very, very applied research. So to me, it was a very, very exciting organization to go to. It was also a time of huge change in, in higher education. And I'm, I'm very conscious in the eight years that, I, that I've been at Brunel, I've been talking about a time of unprecedented change in academia. And that's what it has been. It's been a really quite extraordinary eight years. Um, 2012 was when the 9K fee came in. And I thought, think we saw a tremendous cultural change in, in universities then, which has been, which I think has been challenging for all of us. And the student has become very much the customer um, in a way that perhaps they weren't before then. But we've also seen big changes in, in education policy in many different ways, and also, of course, in, in research policy. So it's been a hugely interesting time. I've absolutely loved it. And I was very fortunate um, two years ago to be elected president of Universities UK, um, which is a great job. I'm, I'm very, very interested in higher education policy, where we're going to, um, how things are changing. And that is a really, really interesting role to be doing. So that's where I am at the moment. So a very swift canter through my, my life. Um, but what's really kept me going through all of this, what have been the, the ups and the downs? And I think however you look at it, no matter how good it is or how bad it is, and it has bad as well as good, um, people are the most important thing. And I put it absolutely top of the list, my, my husband, who's been an amazing supporter, um, my family and all my friends, but also mentors at different stages through my career. And my colleagues, I've, I've had fantastic colleagues and I've just met so many interesting and exciting people. Um, but I think also trying to, trying to find time to do other things. I think it's very easy as an academic and particularly as a researcher to become obsessive and to find that you, you aren't creating time for things, the other things that you want to do. And bringing music back into my life as I did when I was at Imperial, that's made a big difference to me. Um, up until then, my music had been very passive, going and listening to it, um, but actually engaging with it is great. But I've also, you know, I love theater, I love sailing, I love skiing, I like cooking. Um, so that those, those hobbies have been important. And then thinking about you know, how, how you move through your career. Um, I do think some of it is down to you. And I think there is something about your nature. Um, and when I look back on my career, although I wouldn't have said I was ambitious at the time, I think on reflection, I probably was quite ambitious. Um, but there's also that nurture element. Um, and I think I've been very fortunate in that I had a lot of people who've supported me in my career. And I hope very much that people feel that I've supported them. But having a, a passion for the job is absolutely key. If you don't love it, don't do it. And my advice to anyone, if you're in the wrong job, get out of it and get out very quickly um, because it's not gonna get better. But above all, have a sense of humor um, because so many ridiculous things happen and sometimes things seem, seem ghastly, but it's always good to look back and, and have a good laugh about things. And I think good humor around the place makes the world go round. And really, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody. Um, thank you to all those people um, who've helped and supported me all the way through my career, but also very importantly, to those organizations that funded my research, because without them, the research wouldn't have happened. And without the research, I wouldn't have had all that fun. So there you are, there's a quick canter through my life as, as an academic. And I'm very happy to try and take any questions that you might have. I'm going to stop sharing my slides. That works, and I'm back again. Uh, th thank you, Julia. That is really good. Uh, and uh, I'm going to invite all of you just uh, uh, to ask uh, your, uh, your questions, and you can use the chat facility at the bottom. And uh, you know, just uh, we can ask a question on behalf of you, or if you want, you can ask a question direct. Um, so, so let me check. Uh, I can't see a question right now. So, in that case, you know, uh, I, I'm going to grab my chance and I'm going to ask a question to Julia. And um, Julia, recently our prime minister was criticised at the House of Commons for not having the right skill. Skill, the right set of skills to lead through COVID. 
and uh, you know during your presentation you know you talked a lot about your background in um in medicine zoology and uh, and you know your you know technical background and i was wondering um is there something about your training uh, about your education about your background that has prepared you for COVID? because that's really a huge crisis and how do you lead through this crisis well i think i think conflict is is something which is difficult for everybody um, I mean, how I deal with conflict is to talk to people. Now, what was I, was I trained to do it? I don't know. And I, I think that's one of the difficult things about transferable skills. Where, where do you pick up those sorts of skills and how do you know how well you're doing at them? Um, and I, I'm sure that all of you have experienced exactly as I have in, in the last six months. There is much more conflict around at the moment than there is normally. Um, people are very, very anxious. And how do, you, how do you navigate through that conflict? And I think it is by talking to people, getting them to talk to you, trying to understand where they're coming from and trying to get you know, both sides of the story out and being willing to have those conversations. But I think you know, there are also going to be occasions when you are going to end up disagreeing and somebody has to make a decision and move things forward. But I think also important, if, if you can't please someone and you can't resolve the conflict, I think it's important you try and find a way to move on from it. So while you might disagree with someone and you may have ended up making a decision that they don't like, um, not only should you explain that decision, um, but you must make sure that as you go forward working with those people, your relationship is just the same as it was before. And I think the moment you let conflict damage your working relationship with people, then I think you're on a very dangerous path. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, we have a question from uh, Ruth uh, Kaufman. And she says, you know, just uh, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, and she has a question about women's issues and about a thinner swan. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, do you think it is important? And how do you see your role for a thinner swan? Um, well, I do think a thinner swan is important because I, I think, I honestly, I'm, I really honestly think these conditions for women in academia now are far, far, far better than they were when I first started. Um, and I think we've seen that in the numbers and I think we've seen that in the culture, but I don't think we've arrived. I think we've still got areas where we're not, we haven't really got equality right in terms of gender equality as well as other aspects of equality. And I think, I think Athena Swan has been really good in having those conversations. And I led the review, um, which we did last year and we published the review in, in March, which you may have seen. And some really interesting things came out of that. I mean, firstly, there are problems with Athena Swan. It's become very bureaucratic. And the people who are really suffering with Athena Swan are the very people that we're trying to help. And far too many young academics um, are spending far, far too much of their time filling in forms and doing Athena Swan at the expense of doing the things which are going to help them get promoted. And that's not good at all. But the interesting things that came out of the discussions, and we did lots and lots of focus groups going around talking to people in very different roles in very different universities right across the sector. I think we talked to 1500 people face to face. Um, and what came out of that was that, yes, numbers are important and people would like to see roughly equal proportions of men and women in all aspects of, of academia and we're, we're not there yet. But actually they care about culture far, far more than they care about numbers. And so long as they can see numbers going in, in the right direction, they're quite patient, but they really, really care about culture and how we treat each other. And it must be okay to have those sort of difficult conversations um, so that people can talk about the problems they're facing in their lives, which are holding them back. And I do think it's better. I mean, I remember when I was young, um, you, as a woman, you would never have put a photograph of your children on your desk. You probably wouldn't have even owned up to having children um, because you would have been regarded, you know, you, you're just gonna go off and ha go home and, and not pursue your career seriously. I think that's changed. I think that's changed a lot, but we still are not there. So I think there's a lot to do 
And I think Athena Swan, um, if we can simplify it, um, so it doesn't become so time consuming, I think it focuses people's minds. I really do. I think, I think someone is trying to make a, a, a to, to ask a question directly. Okay. Um, Maybe not away. because you could I, hear I, some. I can't see any hands, but you know, I can't you, see any hands myself. Uh, maybe it is on my second screen. Uh, no, I can't see anyone, but um, uh, we have some more questions. And the next question is from Louise Elcote. Uh, and she says, what an amazing career, Julia. Uh, but uh, have you had any setbacks uh, oh, that have you. thrown you off, uh, off course? And how did you manage to get over it and back on track? Right, well, I, I had lots and lots of setbacks. Um, and so, sometimes they're not so big as you think they are. Um, but there, there are always things. I mean, there's always, you know, the, the worry of running a research group, for example, when you don't get your research grants and mm -hmm. you suddenly, you, su you know, you suddenly you're, you're losing your staff that you, you've nurtured and developed and you've got nowhere for them to go. So you feel this huge sense of responsibility and your grant gets turned down. That Those, those things are absolutely self-destroying. Um, and I think I think it's really hard and I, I had one very good bit of advice when I had my first academic job. Um, the chap who actually, actually examined my PhD and he worked in my area so by the time I got my first academic job I, I knew him quite well and I remember he rang me up on my first morning to say you know well done and I hope you're okay and then he said well I'm going to make a pact with you um, because you are going to get grants turned down and you are going to get papers turned down. You know, you're going to get lots of nasty comments from referees because that's what happens to all of us. Um, so I'm going to make a rule with you that every time we get a grant turned down or every time we get a paper turned down, uh, we can ring each other up and we can shout and scream for five minutes. We can use all the bad language we like. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But after that five minutes, we have to put it behind us and try and move on. Um, and actually read those horrible comments because there might be something there that's quite useful. Mm -hmm. um, try not to get offended, but just keep going. Actually, that was really good advice. Um, and I think if you start bearing grudges um, about things that have happened to you, I think it's hard to manage them. So I, th I think one thing I really did learn was when, when things go wrong, try and find a way of putting them behind you and try not to blame everybody around you. Um, and I know we've all been there um, and it's quite a hard thing to do, but that's certainly something that I learned. Um, I think I also learned too that, as I said, I, I was very, very shy when I was young um, and I'm still quite shy. I had to really, really work to do that networking. I found it really tough. And I found it very difficult to go into a room where I didn't know anyone and start talking to people or even, you know, go into a committee where I knew everybody knew everybody and I was very much the new person. Um, and sometimes you get some sort of diffusers. And I remember when I first went to Charing Cross and they had this dreadful committee called the Professoriat, which was all professors. And I was not only the youngest professor, I was also the only female professor at that time. And I went into this room with another professor who decided I think he was going to mentor me and so sat next to me. And um, you know, all these people sort of droned on. I thought, God, when is this going to end? And actually, when am I going to say anything? Because I really don't know what they're talking about. Um, and he sent me a little note and it said, Professor X is going to say this, Professor Y will say that, and Professor X will say that back again. And that's exactly what happened. And somehow that broke the ice because I could see the humor in it all. Mm -hmm. I could see how people are actually, we're all very stereotyped in our behavior. And, and these people were no different from me. And they're having their little spats. And I guess that's what we all do. And that, that was a big icebreaker. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, there is an echo somewhere, I don't know where from, uh, but um, uh, there is another question, it is a long question, and it's all about confidence, and it is from Beth Tinsley, and uh, the question is, how did you find your confidence grew throughout your life or career? Do you think this is something that comes naturally with time, or are there any experiences, people, advice that helped? 
and uh, uh, and uh, Beth goes on to say that she relates to your feeling uh, to your feeling uh, shy when uh, you were a child. Um, uh, so could you please tell us a bit more about confidence, confidence and how we can make it happen? I think it's really difficult, and I, I was certainly not very confident when I, as I said, I was very shy, very very shy, and I think I suffered from the usual female imposter syndrome, and I think I probably felt that through through most of my career. So how, how do you try and overcome it? Um, I think your your friends are very important, um, very, very important. I, I think mentors are unbelievably important. I really do. Um, people that you can talk to honestly uh, and people that you know are going to be honest with you. Um, and I think it, you know, it's no use people telling you you're wonderful and it's all going to be fine when actually you know it's not wonderful. Um, and you know you've got a problem and you need to try and solve it, it's far, far better to find a constructive way forward of trying to solve it. What I haven't found works, I've had two coaches um, in my life, and I frankly thought they were both a complete not a waste of time. Um, they, they were just chat shocks, and I didn't get anything from it at all. But maybe that's just me, and I had the wrong coaches. I'm sure there's some brilliant ones out there, and they work really well for people, but that didn't work for me at all. Um, but have it, having really good mentors and also having colleagues who were prepared to be honest. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that we used to do a lot, particularly when I was at Imperial, but also, well, actually also at the Royal Free and Charing Cross, was rehearsing people for presentations. Now, I can't tell you how terrified I was when I gave my first research presentation to a learning <laughs> society. I was absolutely terrified. I really was. I would have done anything not to do it. Um, but it was rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. So by the time I got onto the stage to do it, I did know what I was going to say. I was very, very well prepared. And I think if you're not confident about something, whatever it is, it is really, really, really worth investing the time in doing everything you can to prepare. Um, there are some eventualities that you can't prepare for. You're going to get the question you can't answer. You're going to chair the committee where you can't get them under control because they're all going to argue and you can't get them to consensus. It's going to happen. Um, don't let it upset you. Get through it. Come out. Sit down. Reflect. And talk to someone you trust about it. If it's really upset you, talk to someone about it. Don't bottle it up. Uh, thank you. This is solid advice. Um, uh, and we have uh, uh, the next question from uh, Julia Benet. Um, uh, at what point did you let go of academic research and focus just on leadership? How did you know it was time? Oh, really hard. I don't think I've ever known it was time. Um, I think it, it's, it's really hard. I know when I went to do the, the pro-rector job at Imperial, um, I... I did a negotiation. That was the first time I'd done a negotiation. I'd never negotiated anything for myself before. Important thing to learn. Um, I negotiated one day a week research. Um, and that was enough to keep my foot in the door. Not enough to do what I used to do, but it was enough to keep my foot in the door. And that, that was good. And when I went to Brunel, I was a bit wise on that one by then. So I negotiated an honorary contract with Imperial um, so that I still have my foot in the door in research. Now that was a bit of a pipe dream um, because it simply wasn't possible to, to run the university and run a research group at the same time. That was ridiculously optimistic, but it did still enable me to keep my, just keep my interest there. I could go to lab meetings and just hear what was going on. So the interest was still there, but the love never disappears from you. And in the last um, three or four months, I've been talking to a lot of people about test and trace because I'm interested in, in the methods that they're using for um, testing for, for the COVID tests. And I can, I can feel that passion for science coming back and that real passion to want to get in there and really understand what's happening and you know, get into the science of it. Of course, I haven't got time and I haven't got the expertise now either. Um, but I don't think that passion ever leaves you. It's a curiosity. I think it's really good. Uh, and, uh, um, I did, just if I can make an observation, because during the, the, your presentation, um, I noticed that you were prepared to move institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something I've noticed with many successful uh, academics and practitioners. They are willing 
uh, to move jobs uh, and uh, and very often they move up the, the career ladder. And I was wondering this willingness to embrace, um, uh, you know, just um, new things and uh, to explore new opportunities, mm. uh, you know, is it, it must be a positive thing. And can you tell us a bit more about this? Yeah, I, I, th I think it. I think it's a very positive thing. And actually, looking back on it, um, I think probably I spent too long in some places. And hindsight's wonderful. But as I said, right at the very beginning of my career, when I got married, we had made this decision we were going to stay in London. So that gave me a bit of choice. And of course, I could have gone a bit around the outside of London as well. But I never had. I I do. In some ways, I would have liked to have worked abroad a little bit, but that opportunity wasn't there. So I, d I don't regret it because I've had such a fantastic home life. But I do, th I would say to someone now starting off, if you can find a way of getting some experience overseas, it is really worth it, not because it's better. Uh, and I think when I was young, there was an ethos that international people were better than people from the UK, which used to really annoy me. Um, but I, I do think the experience of working somewhere else is good. But I Yes, I think being willing to embrace change, um, you know, the world moves on and I think we all have to accept the world moves on. And I've always, I've always wanted to be part of it. That's always been very important to me. I quite like change. Um, probably I like change too much. Um, but if you're, if you're part of the discussion, you can influence the shape of things to come, um, at least sometimes, not always but you can sometimes influence the shape of things to come. If you're going to dig your toes in and you don't want change, you actually, I think, risk becoming a nuisance because you'll get people saying, oh, well, they'll never agree. Oh, they'll never do that. Oh, don't ask them because they won't agree. They'll just dig their toes in. And that actually is very negative. And I'm sure none of you are like that at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I think embracing change is important. Um, and if you don't like it, it's much better to be in the tent so that you can at least shape what is happening because lots of things we can't control. Um, and I wasn't particularly pleased that students are paying 9K fees. I'm not sure, sure you aren't either. Mm. But at least you can, you can be part of the discussion in, in how you can change their educational experience to make them feel that they are truly getting value for the money that, that they're paying. And you can respond to consultations. You can you can engage in the discussion rather than just jumping up and down and saying, "Oh, this is all dreadful. I don't like it." Um, it's you you can actually try and influence things, mm -hmm. but uh, you uh, won't uh, always uh, succeed. So. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and you said how important it is uh, to have a great mentor. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when it comes to choosing a mentor and trying to identify a mentor, uh, can you give us some, some advice? Would you go for someone who is in the same sector, in the same department, or would you go for someone who is from a different sector um, or from another department? Uh, you know, how do you go about it? And how do you identify these people? How do you engage with them? I think I think they've happened more by by accident than, than design, and I, I think it's I think it's really how you how you engage with people. I think choosing someone and saying will you be my mentor is quite difficult. And I know we have formal mentoring schemes now, and I, I think they're very good. But I, I think a lot of these things sort of happen almost by osmosis. Um, and I, I think one thing we are bad at as a sector now, and it's partly because it's we are too big. Um, but when I was young, the learned societies used to play a very important role in, in mentoring people. And it used to be the thing that the senior professors looked out for, you know, the early career researchers who they thought had talent. And they made it their business to, to talk to them and talk to them about their career and what they were doing. You know, the professor from Cambridge who rang me up and told me to apply for that job. That was a classic example of him. I, I knew him quite well through networking. Um, that was a classic example of, of how it worked. But I think having people that you can talk to, out, certainly out of your line management, I think it's it doesn't work if it's in, in your line management because you've got a conflict. Um, I think also out of your department. And I think there's a lot to be said for outside of your profession, actually. Um, and I think we don't... Um, I think we don't um, engage enough in academia with people who aren't academics. And I think we can learn an awful lot from people outside of academia. 
and um, we're just not good at it. You're obviously very good at it as a society, but um, I think academics can tend to be very insular and that's not good for academia and it's not good for the people. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I can't see any more questions coming up. Uh, I, I can hear the echo of my voice, uh, but I, I can't see any more questions coming up. Uh, but uh, it, it, I, I don't know, Nasia, if you want to add anything? Oh, yeah, I just want to maybe to make the last question. So uh, thanks, Julie, again for the amazing talk. And uh, given your uh, depth and breadth of career, I just want to know if you have any special advice in these special circumstances for all those early career researchers or final year PhDs, postdocs that are seeing a job market at the moment that, uh, let's say, is not encouraging. But uh, uh, I don't, I am afraid that some may, I don't know, lose their willingness to keep going in this world because at the moment I, I've heard of colleagues that have not had good experience at this moment in time, uh, like uh, final PhD students or others. So uh, what would you say to them in this current moment? Well, I, I think it's really tough and, and my heart goes out to them. Um, I think everybody is doing everything they can for PhD students to make sure that they can complete their PhDs. And I, I really would say to all of you, stick in there and make sure that you get that PhD, no matter how tough it is, try and find a way of keeping at it. But I think in terms of the job market going forward, of course, it's tough at the moment. It's, it's tough for everybody. But I, I think just a couple of rays of light for you, because I'm sure that's what you'd like. Um, there, there was a very interesting report out from the Resolution Foundation in May 2020. And what they did was they look, they've looked back over the last 12 or 15 years at um, job outcomes for people leaving education at different stages. So they looked at 16, 18, 21, and then PhDs. And there is no doubt the higher the qualification you've got, the more quickly people got back into, into well-paid graduate level jobs. So I would say to PhD students, the jobs will come. They may not be there at the moment, they will come. So that'd be my first bit of advice. My second bit of advice is that the government has promised a big investment in research. It's still talking about an extra 22 billion pounds going into, into research. Um, so there should, in theory, at least be more research money for people. So keep the optimism up. But the other thing I would say um, is, as a researcher, you've got a fantastically broad range of skills. And I know most researchers want to spend the rest of their life doing research. Um, but it's not always possible because there aren't always enough jobs for everybody. And I think it's important that you spend time and you talk to careers advice people um, to look at the very broad range of things there are for people with a PhD, because you've got a fantastic range of transferable skills. Um, all the skills that your employers are looking for are in a PhD. You're analytical, you're going to take an evidence-based, you're good communicators, you're good team workers, everything that employers are looking for so if, you're, if the door isn't going to open for you for research, don't feel you're a disaster, please. Just think you're going to change direction a little bit because you're still going to have a stellar career. Um, people, you know, we need people like you. So go for it. Thank you very much. And on that note, uh, we're going to finish and, uh, you know, a virtual clap. Many thanks, uh, Julia. That was really amazing. Many, many thanks for being with us uh, today. And there are some lovely comments, uh, uh, you know, just in our chat facility uh, from uh, Beth, uh, from uh, Dorian, who is based in the Netherlands, uh, from uh, Dilek, from John Ryan, uh, and so on. So thank you uh, very much for coming today. I'm going to share my screen uh, again because uh, I want to show you what to expect in the second half of uh, um, this presentation, if the system can allow me to move on. Uh, yes, so I'm pleased to say that we're going to have uh, a well-deserved uh, break for 15 minutes. And uh, I'm sure all of us would love to have a nice uh, cup of coffee or tea or biscuits or anything else you fancy, perhaps a glass of wine. Uh, and um, in the second half of the session, we are going to have a networking activity that uh, will be led uh, by Laura Reed. 
Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to have a couple of uh, uh, networking sessions and then we're going just to give you some more information about water. So for the time being, you know, just uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you soon and uh, thank you again to Julia. It's quite far on in some people's lives. It's quite late in my life. And, and then it's scary because you, you stick yourself out there and you know it's a stupid question you're about to ask because everybody else has understood or because it's off pattern. Because why wouldn't the speaker have said it if it was important? So why would you? And um, yeah. And, and I have to say, I'm so sorry, Laura, because we seem, uh, uh, you know, a few people had to leave, uh, you, you know, just... Uh, I think whenever we do things, you know, there's a reflection bit. Uh, and I think perhaps, you know, just uh, the first half of the session was, uh, uh, you know, slightly longer. But a few people have left us. But on a positive side, it feels like a very cozy environment, don't you think? It's very cozy and nice. Yeah, yeah, friendly environment, which is what... Yeah, a very friendly environment. This is the way we like it. Uh, so, so perhaps, you know, we can make a start uh, and uh, I'm going to share my uh, screen and And this is a lovely uh, photo from uh, Laura uh, and I have to say I'm so delighted to introduce Laura. Uh, and Laura, you know, many of you might, uh, you know, have come across her work because she's uh, the CEO of Simulate and we don't really have that many female CEOs around us. And uh, also Laura, you know, uh, you know, has been um, responsible for ensuring that people in simulation technology are achieving the vision of changing the way that people make decisions. And in the profession of OR, I think this is really our bread and butter, how we can make people, you know, take better decisions. That's very, very important. But it was really, you know, just uh, impressed because, you know, just uh, Laura has a background in maths, statistics and OR. And in her career, you know, she has worked for the NHS, large corporations, and now she is with Simulate and she has a passion for business. And I think life is very, very, very important to have a passion, uh, you know, just uh, about the things. Uh, and uh, it's all about how we can enable people in the organizations to grow and move forward. Uh, now, I have to say that Laura also has um, an interest in behavior health and well-being and in the last few months you know all these three things have been very very important uh, and i'm really impressed laura because uh, uh, you also have an interest in mental health and how many of us can find the time to do other things outside our profession and uh, julia said before that it's very very important to do that and you have excelled uh, because you became a trustee of uh, penumbra uh, and this is the leading Scottish mental health uh, charity. And in 2015, uh, Laura became the chair of the, the charity. Uh, in 2015, she became, you know, just a trustee. And then, you know, just uh, uh, Laura went on to become the chair in 2019. Uh, if, if all this was not enough, uh, uh, Laura is also helping two little people at home, her two daughters. Uh, so, you know, three things, the CEO of a big company, a chair of a charity, and uh, a, a mom to two daughters. Uh, well, we salute you, uh, Laura. So uh, if you want, uh, you can make a start. I'm going to stop sharing my slides. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction, Nadia. Um, as we've already said, or a few people have already said, it's, it's great to be here. It's taken a while. It's, um, it's almost eight months since our original date, but we've got here. Um, and I really enjoyed hearing Julia's talk. Um, I think there was a lot of advice for all of us there, whether or not you've got, you know, you're in academia or not. Um, and Nadia, you mentioned about my sort of passion for health and well-being and mental health. But I still took more from Julia's talk about, you know, um, the, the things she's doing with music. And it's definitely struck a chord in me to think about what I'm doing with that in my sort of in my personal life. Um, so let me start sharing my desktop, which of course I can't find now. I can, oh, there we go. Okay, so can you see um, PowerPoint or see a slide?
I can't hear us. Yes, yes, we can. Oh, that's good. Okay, okay, that's great. So, um, interesting first slide, huh? Um, why have I put this up here? This used to be my favorite place when I had to go to a networking event. Um, the Lou's, ladies lose for summer to escape to where it didn't feel like everyone was looking at little old me or staring at me, not just looking, but staring. And summer to escape, the groups of people almost seemed to know each other. I mean, I know I wasn't the only one that had this tactic. Quite a few friends and colleagues have done the same. There's either the lose or there's the trusty phone where you can appear to be engrossed in a really urgent and important email. Um, and yet I really, really enjoy networking now and I look forward to it. And today, what I wanted to do as part of the intro before we go into our own networking sessions was take you through the process I went through to, to change my attitude to networking. So, um, you'll be glad to hear that I quickly realized that hiding in the loose wasn't getting me anywhere. Um, you know, apart from the obvious fact that it's not the most pleasant place to spend time, it was making me feel a lot worse about networking. And so I tried to think about it differently. I asked myself the question, why network? I mean, surely if you unpick what would make networking easier, you know, why I'm doing it, that would make networking easier. And bear in mind at this point, I was definitely still seeing networking as something that I had to do and that I should do. I was just looking for something to make it more bearable. So why network? I came up with a list. It means I could find a mentor. You know, Julia's just talked about how important mentors have been to her career. So that sounds like a good one. I can learn. And develop, I can find new job opportunities, and I can get a boost from being in a different environment, you know, away from the normal office environment, somewhere different, someone that sort of sparks you creative, creatively. Um, and so that, that seems like a good list. It's positive, all good reasons that, you know, that would take me further. But for me, this was just as unsatisfactory as um, my initial reason for thinking why I network, that I had to do it. And the problem is that this is all I, I, I. You know, it's very self-serving. And for me, you know, if I believe that that's what everyone in a networking event is thinking, they're all thinking I, 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 and me, 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 well, that doesn't give me a very good feeling about that type of environment. So um, I'm gonna quick exercise now with everybody. Um, you're only gonna get about a minute to do this, but I want everyone to think about an event from their past. And that event is where you set out to nurture a relationship. And pick one. It should, it should either be a nurture, a relationship that was to connect work for you in your professional life or one that was for your personal life. I want you to have a think about it. If you want to jot down a couple of lines about it, how it happened, who it was with and how, how it made you feel. I'm just going to give you a minute to think about it. And as, as I said, if you want to jot some things down as well. So could you repeat the question, please? Yes, of course. So um, think about an event where you set out to nurture a relationship and it's either to be where the relationship is going to benefit your personal life or your professional life. And then just think about how it happened, who it was with, how it made you feel. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, going to move on now. Boy, a minute feels a long time um, when you're sort of sitting here in silence. So with those in mind, um, I'd like you to try and fill in the gaps in these word fragments. Don't take any time to think about it. Just write down the first word that you think of when you look at each of these three words. Um, and I'm just going to give you something like 10 seconds for it. Okay, move on. So, a 2014 study found that professional networking makes people feel unclean as it's self, well, in my case, because it feels like it's self-serving. And it actually found that people avoid professional networking, even though it's good for their careers because it makes them feel physically dirty. 
So they, um, they did several experiments and I put the details on the um, research at the bottom of the slide here. They did several experiments, one of which was where they took 306 participants, asked them to recall an event from the past as you, as you just did there. They got a bit longer than a minute, they got five minutes. And afterwards they did, again, like I've asked you to do here and asked them to complete these, um, these word fragments. Well, there was more than these, but I've picked out three here. Participants in the group who picked a scenario that was about their professional life, so about professional networking, professional connections, tended to um, fill in the words as shower, wash, and soap. For participants that did it for their personal life, tended to choose words such as shaker, with, and ship. Um, so it's really interesting to see how the, the bias can come through and the perception of it. Um, and so it shows that I'm not alone, or I wasn't alone in not enjoying professional networking, and it's because I perceive it in a certain way. So after I, um, I came up with that list about why networking, and I realized that list was unsatisfactory for me because it was I, 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 and me, me, me. Um, I went through an exercise to try and transform my thoughts about networking, essentially cleansing my mind of all the negative beliefs and replacing them with positive ones. Um, and I mean, we'll all be aware of this, your, th your thoughts and beliefs, they shape your world. They're so, so powerful. Um, you know, scientists have found that a lot of our beliefs come from our childhood and from our family, or sort of our family environment. So they're really, really ingrained in us and they influence how we behave and how we view and interact with the world. Um, you know, our beliefs have a huge impact on what we do and whether we succeed. Um, and we can, one way to classify beliefs, as I've got on the slide here, is about enabling beliefs and limiting beliefs. Um, which I'm sure you know some of you will have come across. And um, enabling beliefs are the beliefs that empower us and they encourage us to try, they encourage us to take risks and they help us go, go forward, they help us grow. Limiting beliefs are the ones that restrict how we see the world. Um, and the way to think about this was if you think about how if you were looking at the world through the peephole in a door, and the scope is limited, and you can't see all that there is to see. And if you were to look at the world through the, a lens, you know, in a, through the people in a door 24 seven, just think how much of life you would miss. And limiting beliefs act like that people. They keep us from seeing everything that's out there in the world. So you have enabling beliefs and limiting beliefs, and you can change a belief. Um, after all, a belief is just a, a practice, simply a practice thought. However, it is a very well practiced thought. You know, think about the ones that we've carried with us since childhood. So it's not easy to do, but it means that we can do it um, and realize our full potential. And so some examples of enabling and sort of limiting thoughts, um, what have we got here? So um, I'm not able to do that. And where you could think about that in an enabling way is I'm intelligent, if I work hard, I can learn most things. A good example for me on that is presentations. Um, you know, presentations, they're not my thing, but I'm here today and I do them in other places as well. I mean, it is about, you know, I, I've definitely had to sort of transform my thinking about presentations. I can't succeed, so there's no point in trying, you know, the good old fear of failure. It's always there for people. And the way to think about it is, you know, this might just work, so it's worth me giving it a go. If it's not happened yet, why should it ever happen? How can you think about that differently? Well, if you think about it, there's got to be a different way to make this happen. There's got to be a different way to look at this. And if I can make this happen, it's gonna be a real game changer. And then um, last one, one that I can't believe that I'm actually finding myself thinking now and again, or more, more frequently, I suppose, is that I'm too old for this. And I, I suppose the cliched one in that is that you're never too old for things. If that doesn't work for you, it's more a case of, well, the older I am, the more lived experience I've gotten, the better chance I've got of succeeding. So limiting thoughts and enabling thoughts. And the, how did I approach these then with, um, networking. Um, I worked through an exercise, as you see on the screen here, um, and I first set out and thought, right, well, okay, what are the limiting thoughts that I have? What's the not so useful beliefs? My current, my limiting thought was, I don't have enough of relevance or experience to talk about with people, meaning that networking is just false and manipulative, you know, that feeling of it being unclean and being self-serving. When I thought that way, it meant that I was thinking things like, you know, I'm not seen as an expert or a significant player. People there aren't going to be interested in what I'm interested in and passionate in. And then uh, for me in particular, I was quite terrified of letting the simulate down. I didn't want to let the business down and give the wrong impression of them. The behaviors that it would mean that I behave, um, sort of exhibited unfriendly body language, you know, eyes down, arms crossed, 
And that's if you even got to see me, because otherwise I might be hiding, as we talked about at the beginning, you know, away in the loos um, on the phone. And the results from that are that, you know, nobody approaches you because, or approaches me because I don't look approachful. And it just reinforces that negative image of networking and becomes, becomes a vicious cycle. So I then went through the exercise of saying, well, what happens if that limiting belief just completely disappeared? What impact would that have on what I could achieve? So I turned the limiting thought into an enabling thought. What would happen if I did have something of relevance and interest to talk about people? And so it meant that I started to think about, well, you know what, I'm really looking forward to engaging with people. I'm looking forward to what I can learn and what I can share with them. You know, I started to think things like, well, I'm sure I can help people. I'm really curious about the people I'm going to be speaking to today. And a lot of people here probably feel the same way as I do. I set out the behaviors, the way I wanted to, the things I wanted to do differently. So I'm going to actively listen to people and I'm going to show that I am curious because I'm going to ask questions. Um, this one, a good one, because it does, it can throw you, I'm going to have a well-practiced answer you know, a 30 second pitch that question, question, tell me about yourself. And I'm going to look out for people on their own who are probably feeling the same way I do, and I'm going to try and involve them and include them. And what's going to happen if I sort of look to the future and if I, you know, I'm able to change my thoughts, bring in these new behaviours, the conversation will flow. Um, I'll find I've actually helped someone because I've shared with them my experiences. I'm going to feel like I've really accomplished something. You know, I put myself outside my, my comfort zone and accomplish something in a space that's not a natural one, and I'm actually going to have fun. So, um, final slide. What's the steps to, to take this forward? Work through the table that was in the previous slide and get clear on your alternative outcome. You know, it's a bit of effort to do that. I mean, I didn't just sit down and jot through that. It was a bit of work. And in fact, I used um, a colleague to, to talk me through it and sort of pull things, or sort of pull things out of me. Um, perhaps you even want to narrow down the table and it to be one element about network and maybe you find it really hard to break into a group so make it focused on that um, take time um, sorry take time and um, to do that then you it helps I think to pick one behavior at a time um, and put it into practice that you know I had a few behaviors listed there but it's much easier to pick one practice it so it becomes a habit then you'll feel you're winning at that and it makes it easier to pick another behavior take that to your networking um, you know, it's, it's, you're not going to go overnight from one extreme to the other, um, but this will help you to do that. Um, when you hear that voice of your limiting belief, you know, the internal voice that's saying, you know, I can't do this or networking's hard or it's false or manipulative, just recognize it for that and realize it's not a set in stone and you don't have to listen to it. Um, and, you know, the final thing is believe you can change. I mean, that's a really good example of another limiting belief, isn't it? I can't change. Yes, you can. Everyone can. So we need to believe that we can do that. So in fact, the next step, um, our very next step is that we're going to go into the breakout sessions and get on with some actual networking. We're having two sessions of 15 minutes each. Um, my understanding is, and I'm sure I'll get corrected if I've got this wrong, is the tech will be put automatically into groups just now. And then the tech will pull us back into the auditorium at the end of our first um, session and then place us into our next one. Um, you've got this talk as an icebreaker, you know, discuss what you agreed with, what you disagreed with. Um, and then we will see you here at the end for, for closing comments. So I think is it over to you now, Nadia? Yes, uh, thank you, Laura. And uh, I'm going to ask Amy to divide us all into groups. And I have to say that, uh, you know, I do realize that some of you uh, might have uh, an other engagement. So if you cannot really join us for the breakout discussions, you can leave us now, but thank you so much for coming. So I'm going to just give you just a few seconds, you know, if you want to leave, because we don't really have the time to join us in our breakout discussions. There we go, got it. Have we got everyone back then? We can, we can close. Um, okay, that was, that was awesome. <laughs> Oh, I really enjoyed chatting to the people in my session. I've got to meet uh, Louise, Sonia and Francis and Dorian um, today. I hadn't met any of them before. Um, and it just reminded me, Warren gives us a great opportunity to connect with our community. Um, so thank you to everyone involved in putting today on and on all the other Warren activities that, that happen as well. 
I'm not sure if we're sharing slides or not. If we're not, um, I'm more than happy if anyone wants to contact me and I can share the template that I use, you know, the sort of table I work through to try and change um, the beliefs. Please do keep in touch. Um, and, you know, I look forward to talking to more of you at the next events. Um, I'll be listening. I'll be curious and I definitely won't be hiding in the loose. So thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you everyone for taking part in the activities afterwards. Uh, so thank you, Laura. That was really a colossal task. Uh, and uh, uh, could you please all join me for a virtual club, please? Thank you, Laura. Very grateful to you. <laughs> That's even better, Valen. Uh, I, I do. Uh, and you know, it's uh, it's back to us and uh, Nasia. Here I am. <laughs> yes, you, you know this is the wrap up, uh, and uh, all of us we've had very interesting conversations in our uh, breakout uh, rooms. And now it's over to Nasia, who's going to tell us a bit more about uh, uh, Warren activities. Okay, so from me, I'm just gonna inform you that we're gonna have tons of activities. So Ruth Kaufman is still with us. I think she's the chair of the uh, events uh, group of Warren and uh, she has uh, so many suggestions and um, we will be working all together within the uh, committee uh, to try bring all these events to life. So for sure, one of the opportunity would be to have uh, again an event uh, a little bit similar to the one of today. So with some eminent or prominent speaker uh, being an uh, in inspiration or uh, sharing his experience with us. Um, another uh, project we're working on uh, where uh, Nadia is uh, leading is the one about career development and mentoring. So we'll come back to you when uh, this project develops uh, more, but uh, it would be very nice to uh, try and have some mentor and mentees uh, relationship even through Warren. Uh, then there will be some lighting talks. Uh, if uh, some of you have been able to join us during the previous lockdown, uh, Ruth has been organized some very nice online events and uh, some uh, talks uh, were there as well, some specific teams, okay, so we may try and um, repropose that. Uh, another like theme that came out from the previous lockdown that was very interesting uh, was the one on imposter syndrome. So for next year, we're thinking about um, in parallel workshops on particular aspects of this syndrome called living with it. Uh, so we'll see. And uh, finally, another possible option we're thinking of is a um, kind of wikiton, so a way in which uh, to raise the profile of uh, women in operational research and analytics. We are also thinking about uh, an event uh, related to Christmas, a kind of a Christmas social. Uh, we'll come with uh, more details uh, sooner to the time, but uh, please follow us for uh, our uh, calendar of events. As you can see, we have uh, many ideas and uh, we'll try to inform you about everything. So thank you. Thank you, Nasia. Uh, so 45% uh, of people, you know, participants at the very beginning, you know, you were not really part of Gordon. So if you have enjoyed the session today, please, please join us. Uh, and if you would like to help with the Warren Committee, uh, just and the three main activities, events, mentoring, and uh, social media, please, we would like to hear from you. Um, and uh, in the first instance, you can really send an email to Francis or Amy, and you can find the details on the Warren uh, website. Uh, and I would like really to ask you if you can take a moment really to do a, a survey to give us some feedback, uh, because we always take uh, feedback into account when it comes to uh, designing uh, our uh, sessions. So please take a moment to do this survey monkey uh, questionnaire, and also you can really find the QR code of the survey at the bottom right uh, of uh, this uh, slide. Um, um, I have to say, you know, just I don't really want to give many details from, but from what I hear, you know, just um, a few people from Warren, uh, they're putting together a very exciting Christmas uh, event that promises to be a Christmas cracker. So you're going to hear from us in the, the near future about this, uh, but I'm not supposed to, to, to say any more about this. Uh, I would like to help Julia and Laura, just many, many thanks again for your time. 
and giving us some really interesting uh, presentations today. And as I said before, you know, there is an army of people always, you know, there's so many people working behind the scenes. A big thank you to Francis, Ruth and Amy. And I have to say thank you to, for all, to all of you, you know, we made it to the end. Thank you so much for being uh, with us today. So keep well, keep safe and uh, see you soon. <laughs>